This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 20. Another episode about the Barkley Marathons covering its first few years starting in 1986. The Barkley Marathons, the toughest trail race in the world, is held in and near Frozen Head State Park in Tennessee with a distance of more than 100 miles. The first year it was held was in 1986 and it now is world famous. Only 40 runners are selected to run each year. This episode is part two of an early history of the Barkley. In episode 19, I covered the fascinating back history of the mountains, the prison, the mines, the inmates, and the escapees that led up to the creation of the Barkley in the Cumberland Mountains. If you have not already, you'll want to listen to that last episode. Barkley is the brainchild of Gary Cantrell, also known as Lazarus Lake, and his lifetime friend, Carl Henn, also known as Raw Dog. In 1985, they had been intrigued by the very few miles that James Earl Ray had covered back in 1977 during his 54 and a half hour prison escape in the mountains. Cantrell felt that he could do much better. Ray's prison escape is covered in episode 19. In 1985, Cantrell and Hen went up into the wilderness to backpack in two days the Boundary Trail, about 20 miles, that was constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps decades earlier. Four people died building the trail. They had just made it a park when we went up there and did that. We weren't even aware. We got there and they had a trailer with park rangers. The first thing it said was that to go on those trails, you had to get special permission from the rangers. And they didn't want to let us go. And then they tried to talk us out of it because they said they would just nobody had made it all the way around those trails. and They would just have to come and rescue us. And we we said, no, no, we will do it. We got through. We hiked half of it the first day and then camped overnight and then hiked the other half of the loop the, the next next day. And then we came back to the ranger station and said, oh, yeah, we, we did it. It was fun. And we have friends who would really enjoy coming out here to do this trail. <laughs> the idea for the Barkley had been hatched, and a course was designed and plans put into place for the first year of the Barkley in 1986 at Frozen Head State Park. Cantrell later said, Someone told me that every ultra has its signature hill, the nasty one that totally is unreasonable and makes or breaks the race. The Barkley is like all those hills, just put end to end. In 1933, the Tennessee governor set aside a large portion of the Brushy Mountain State Prison lands to establish Morgan State Forest. That year, the Civilian Conservation Corps came and constructed roads, facilities, and some trails that Barkley uses today, including the Boundary Trail. Rattlesnakes and all the prison escapes taking place every year made it difficult to establish a camp in the forest until 1938. In 1952, a large portion of the forest was burned and prison inmates were used to fight the fire. In about 1970, the Frozen Head State Park was established. One of the unknown heroes of the Barkley is Don Todd of Wartburg, Tennessee. He was active since the 1960s in an effort to protect the area that became Frozen Head State Park. Since the 60s, He led wildflower spotting hikes within the park to acquaint others with its diversity of plants and animals. Todd pushed to have nine square miles around Frozen Head declared unsuitable for coal mining and helped stop plans for a huge strip mine on Frozen Head which would have been visible from 80% of the trails within the park. Thankfully that didn't happen and Todd was proud that the park looks pretty much the way it did when, quote, the first white men came. He said, quote, it's something I put value on trying to improve the quality of life in the mountains a little bit. In 1985, he was awarded the Gulf Conservation Award for his efforts. Coal strip mining was a constant worry for the area. In 1971, a coordinated effort gathered petitions and fought to not allow state land close to the park to be sold off to potential strip miners. 
1973, a state bill was introduced to prevent strip mining of 2,500 acres of coal land near Frozen Head. But strip mining was a constant threat to the park. In 1978, a public hearing was held in Wartburg about doing strip mining on Bird Mountain right on the future Barkley course. The hearing was heated and dominated by miners. Three members, including two women of Save Our Cumberland Mountains organization, were verbally and physically abused by the miners after the hearing. The man said, I was hit several times by a number of miners. Two women in the crew got attacked. One of them was thrown around by the hair of the head and hit while another woman was struck. If these plans had gone forward, it is likely that there never would have been the Barkley Marathons. Also in 1978, another prison was planned to be built right near the entrance of Frozen Head State Park, where a prison honor farm had existed. It would have been a $7.5 million, 400-bed structure. A citizens group filed a suit against the plan, stating it would impede development of an environmental education center planned nearby. The Frozen Head State Park Association also joined in the suit. The suit was dismissed by Judge Ben Cantrell, but it also was found that the correction department officials did not use proper guidelines for selecting the site. In 1986, Gary Cantrell, now a veteran runner of more than 50 ultras, co-created the Barkley Marathons with Carl Henn. The grueling event that attracted some unsuspecting runners was held for the first time on March 1st, 1986. The race was named after one of Cantrell's early running partners, Barry Barkley. Cantrell said, quote, Barry was injured in Vietnam, so he can't run, but he's always been enthusiastic about the sport. He came once back in the 80s, but he's a farmer and spring is planting season. He keeps saying one day he'll retire and come see it. For the early years, the race was 50 to 55 miles or so, with about 25,000 to 27,000 feet of climbing and a 24-hour cutoff for the first year. Cantrell likes to point out that the course has always had a net elevation change of zero. Well, the trail hadn't been maintained since the 1930s. You, you either went over, under, around, or through all the obstacles, and the trail itself was on hillsides so steep that if you got off the trail, you couldn't go. You would just go sliding off down the hill. In 1986, the course was run in a counterclockwise direction, and from 1987 to 1995, the direction of the course was run in the clockwise direction. Thirteen unlucky runners started that first year, including Cantrell. They paid the entrance fee of 35 cents. Three runners arriving late were the luckiest. During the first hour before dawn, they went up the wrong mountain, probably Frozen Head, and soon were out. After 12.5 miles, the remaining eight started to tackle the very difficult north section. Cantrell explained, it is poorly marked, severely eroded, overgrown, and laced with deadfalls. Cantrell remembered, there were places where you would come to a pile of tree trunks. Me and Gary Buffington came to one and we were trying to figure out how to get across it. It was on such a steep hillside. I then had an idea. I told Gary to give me his pack for a second and he gave it to me and I threw it over the top of the trees onto the trail on the other side. I then took my pack and threw it over there too. I said, now we have to get there. We got across. Two thrashed runners completed the first 20 mile loop in under nine hours, but were wise and chose to quit. Three fortunate runners got lost and took an easy way out on the quitters Jeep trail and headed for home before completing the lap. These included Doyle Carpenter and Fred Pylon who ran together but on the North Boundary Trail got lost after Jury Ridge, which was about three quarters around the loop. Three remained. Buffington and Cantrell finished the first loop in 12 hours and 18 minutes and called it quits. They were probably the only ones who ran the loop correctly. Only Damon Douglas continued on, reaching 35 to 37 miles in 17 hours and 8 minutes. He knew he couldn't finish the last 20 miles by the 24 hour cutoff and called it quits. So there were no finishers that first year, and Cantrell called it, quote, a rousing success all around. 
The participants believed that the course was much longer than claimed. Historian Nick Marshall, who knew Cantrell, wrote that he was always a devious trickster. In his Ultra Running Magazine report, Cantrell wrote, quote, Of course it is still impossible to run 50 miles on a trail in a day, but if anyone wants to try, we'll be doing it again next spring. Cantrell was a regular columnist for the Ultra Runner magazine, writing a column from the South. In his writings, he revealed his philosophies about running and the sport. Even though he was a serious runner and loved the sport, he put it all into perspective. For example, in 1986, he wrote, quote, I do believe our sport is good for us, the participants. However, it really doesn't contribute anything significant to mankind. Some say we are exploring man's limits. I think we are only exploring our own. He knew that Barclay wouldn't cure any world problems, but he could never foresee that in the decades to come, tens of thousands would receive intense inspiration from the race that eats its young. At various races, Cantrell spread the news of his new race and tried to convince runners to come give it a try. 16 unwise runners showed up for the second year in 1987 to run what one returning runner described as, quote, Gary Cantrell's excuse for a trail run. The first woman runner started, Linda Sledge. Entry was a lot easier in those years. You simply called or wrote to Cantrell. His contact information was published in the newspapers, but the entry fee was increased significantly to 50 cents, a penny for each mile. Cantrell offered, quote, a full refund if you stick it out and have a cubic inch of your body not in extreme pain. Tom Possert entered the 1987 Barkley and all eyes, the very few at Frozen Head Park, were on Possert. He was from Cincinnati, Ohio. In college, he took up running to get into shape and discovered the further the distance, the more competitive he became. Possert ran his first ultra in 1984, and among the first races was a 100K, which he ran in a speedy 8 hours 43 minutes. Next, he started his long career with fixed time races at across the year's 24-hour race in Arizona. A fellow runner commented about Possert in that race, quote, Tom Possert was walking strongly. He's tall and thin, with a fine walking stride. It was amusing to watch him stride past those of us trying to run. Possert won with 124 miles, which was the best 24-hour performance that year for an American. The next year, in 1985, he ran JFK 50 and finished in 18th in 7 hours and 40 minutes. He also ran 147 miles at Across the Years, which was the fifth furthest for an American in the modern era of ultra running. People thought Possert was certainly a serious contender to finish the 50-mile Barkley. The 1987 race was moved to April 11th that year. Possert came early and hiked most of the trail and got lost a few days before the race except for a new section that was added last minute because many wildflower enthusiasts were expected to come to the park on the same weekend and they didn't want to conflict with all those people. Even the park rangers had never been on the new section. It involved doing a 1.25 mile climb to the top of Frozen Head. The course that year consisted of three 16.67 mile loops with a 36 hour cutoff. Pre-race chatter among the dozen runners involved being intimidated by the terrain and talking about James Earl Ray's escape from prison and his suffering in the hills. Soon after the 6 a.m. start, Possert and another runner took the lead. The field included six Marines led by Sergeant Stone with backpacks, canteens, and heavy boots. These Marines had previously marched the JFK 50 and believed they would certainly finish Barkley. Stone told his men that if they didn't finish, they would get extra duty. First up was climbing switchbacks up to the top of Bird Mountain. Fred Pylon of Massachusetts was an experienced race director who owned a runner's shop. He was co-editor of Ultra Running Magazine and also was an early veteran of Mountain 100 Milers. He had finished Old Dominion 100 twice in 1979 and 1980, and Wasatch 100 in 1983. He had also competed in orienteering contests, but those skills had not helped him enough when he attempted the Barkley the first year, when he went off trail. 
Pylon again returned in 1987 for more punishment. After several miles, he caught up with Possert and another runner in the lead, and they all worked together for a while, trying to not get lost. When they hit the new section, it first went down New River Valley and paralleled the river to the base of Frozen Head. They believed that no one had ever been there before. Pylon wrote, Quote, the top of the valley was guarded by dense strands of briars, blown down trees, huge boulders, and numerous cliffs. They couldn't find the trail that supposedly had been built in 1941. Once at the base of Frozen Head, they found no trail heading up, so they just bushwhacked up. Along the way, they passed numerous seams of coal, old wells, wheels, and pulleys of all sorts, and a cave. It took them two hours to reach the top of Frozen Head. Others took four hours and couldn't find much of a trail either. It was believed that the inmates from the prison used the long forgotten trail to reach a coal mine years before. With all the struggles, Pylon reflected on the spirit of the Barclay that is still true years later. Quote, all of this creates the charm or curse of Barclay. You are on your own, away from civilization for hour after hour, with only the occasional wild animal or bird to welcome as another moving object. Possard and Pylon completed the first 16.7 mile loop in 7 hours. They headed out for loop 2, wondering if they could follow the trail once it became dark. Possard went on ahead until Pylon knew he couldn't keep up. Halfway through the loop during the afternoon, before the most difficult New River Valley section, Possert stopped, rested, ate, and slept until Pylon caught up. He asked, Do you plan to go through hell again? They both declined, knowing that no one would make it through that section twice. The two of them enjoyed the much easier loser run back to the start, reaching there in 14 hours 30 minutes total, and felt okay with their decision to quit. The course won once again. No runners finished. Possert finished with bad blisters and his legs were badly chafed from using tights. Pylon was dehydrated and had a badly sore Achilles tendon. They found out that elite runner Mac Williamson had shown up late to the race and completed the first loop in only five hours. But he had never passed them and they doubted that he went the right way. It didn't matter because he quit too. Cantrell also finished a loop but his time is unknown. The Marines didn't make it all the way, and they were worried about the extra duty that they would have to perform. They did make it through hell, up to the top of Frozen Head. Linda Sledge was hiking near them and found some deer antlers. She conned a polite Marine to haul it to the top of Frozen Head for her. Some runners hoped to return the next year, but knew Gary would change the course, find some more hills, discover some more undiscovered trails. Nineteen brave but foolish runners came in 1988, including 11 newcomers, which were later called virgins. The entry form that year was entitled, quote, The Barkley Marathons, The Race That Eats Its Young. Entry that year included a requirement that each runner write an essay on why they should be allowed to enter. In his letter to entrance, Cantrell wrote, quote, There is no way you'll be finishing the race. They gave out race shirts that year that included a picture of a wolf-like animal feasting on a fallen runner at the bottom of a mountain. Ed Furtaw from North Carolina started running ultras in 1985. In 1987, he ran Cantrell's Strolling Gym 40. Cantrell had invited Furtaw to run Barkley. He decided to take up the challenge in 1988. Cantrell mailed information to Furtaw and would address it to Frozen Head Furtaw or Frozen Ed Furta. The nickname soon stuck and Frozen Ed would become a Barkley and ultra running legend. Cantrell invited Furta to join in with him to do a recon on the course about a month before the 1988 race. They discussed the previous challenges of verifying that runners ran the correct course. Furta suggested using a book feature which Cantrell would adopt with three book checkpoints. Runners had to bring back a page from each book. The books came in the third year because the first two years you realize not everyone is really adept with a map and people clearly hadn't done the right course. People that got lost like that, they weren't they weren't winning. They just were thinking they had done the loop when they hadn't. Frozen Ed came up with the idea of the paperback books. 
And then after we'd done the books a couple of years, it dawned on us, rather than having them get a, just any page out of the book, have them get the page off their bib number. And you get a new bib every lap so you can get new pages out of the book. Cantrell was still pampering the runners and let them have drop bags that were taken to two locations, Frozen Head Tower and Coffin Springs. In mail communications with the runners before the race, Cantrell warned runners that Barkley would, quote, bite them in the ass. He taunted them with, there is no way you'll be finishing this race. He mentioned the health section and wrote, believe me, there aren't four miles to compare to hell anywhere in the planet. Fertal previewed it with Cantrell and left this description, quote, Hell is an incredibly steep ascent that goes westward straight up the side of Frozen Head Mountain. I was amazed at the steepness of the climb. We had to literally pull ourselves uphill from tree to tree in the steepest places. I was astonished to see that there were paint blazes on some of the trees along the hill. Cantrell explained that they were on an old mining trail used by the prisoners years ago. Cantrell described hell, quote, It starts with a cross-country effort that calls for not only an internal compass, but also for an altimeter. On a mountain honeycombed with coal mines and coal roads, the failure to reach the 2,600-foot bench buys the runner an opportunity to log miles of useless searching for the proper cutoff. Once the drop-off is located, there is a steep drop of 1,000 feet. That year, Eric Clifton was one of the newcomers. Clifton was from North Carolina and later from California. He would become the fastest and most dominating 100-mile trail runner during the 1990s. He started distance running in high school in 1976 and ran several marathons, including Boston. He then found his way to triathlons and distance cycling. In 1986, he discovered trail running and started his long career running ultras. He attempted his first 100 in 1987 Western States, but didn't finish because of stomach problems. As a rookie, he had not yet figured out how to recover from problems and continue on. I've just got one strategy, and that's to go as hard as I can for as long as I can. To me, there's not that much of a challenge just going the distance. I have to do it with some sort of a line. I'd rather run like I want to run and and fail than, you know, run conservatively and win. In 1996, Clifton would break the Rocky Raccoon 100 course record with 13 hours, 16 minutes. In 1988, somehow he thought Barkley would be a nice challenge. With Speedsters, Possard, and Clifton in the race, Cantrell gave Furtas some pre-race advice to not play the guide role, let the Speedsters go on. If he did that, he thought Furtas could both finish and win. That year, the climbs totaled about 27,000 feet during the 55 to 60 miles. Possard and Clifton flew around the first loop. Clifton finished in five hours, 50 minutes, with Possard arriving two minutes later. Furtaw finished in 6.54 and Pylon in 8 hours. Seven runners became confused and missed one of the checkpoints. One more runner quit after hell. In all, 11 runners finished the first loop, but only six started loop two. The course was faster this year because the park had removed many blowdowns. During loop two, Possert and Clifton made a critical error, missing a short section to go to the top of Frozen Head again. They thought that they didn't need to summit on the last two loops, but they misunderstood. Cantrell had said that they didn't need to climb to the top of the tower on the last two loops. This was discovered later. Possert finished loop two first, followed by Clifton 90 minutes later who quit at that point, and Ed Furta an hour after that in 15 hours and nine minutes. While Possert was struggling with loop three, word came to the start line that he goofed on the second loop and he would repeat the mistake on his third loop, cutting the course distance by a total of about one mile. Out in the darkness, in fog and rain, Possert continued, not knowing that all his effort would result in a DNF. At 23 hours, 47 minutes, he finished his third loop as Ed Furta scrambled to start his third loop after a very long three hour rest. Possert received the sad news that he had been disqualified and commented, 
Quote, I know what I did, and I'm satisfied with my effort. That was the hardest 24 hours I've ever experienced. Cantrell commented, quote, His class in the face of bitter disappointment stands alone as the brightest moment that will ever be seen at the Barclay. There would be many more disappointing moments in the years to come. By dawn, Fertal was the only one left on the course. After three years, Barkley finally had its first 55-mile finish. Frozen Ed came in 32 hours, 14 minutes. Fertal later wrote, quote, As I approached the finish line, I was expecting a congratulatory crowd to greet me. However, when I arrived at the campground, only Carl's wife, Kathy Hen, and their two children were there. Cantrell soon returned after retrieving the drop bags and presented Fertal with the Barkley Cup. In Cantrell's report of the Barkley, commenting on the number of runners who went off course, he wrote, quote, The runner cannot afford to lapse into a semi-comatose state of pure running and suffering. Failure to stay alert for even a moment can lead to a wander off the trail and finding it again can be quite difficult. Runners were of course curious that now that a runner had successfully finished his course, would Cantrell make it harder? Cantrell announced that for 1989 there would be a 100 mile option with 50,000 feet of wonderful climbing with a 50 hour cutoff. He then taunted, after all, two miles per hour ain't much. I'm sure there are plenty of real runners out there who believe they can do it. We'll see. For 1989, Barkley was appropriately held on April Fool's Day. The 55-mile version was referred to as the short one, and the 100-miler was the long one. Rat Jaw, a new major climb, was added to each loop that went up the south face of Frozen Head. If the runners cared about history, the route was interesting, taking them by the mine ruins and a mine guard house, which would be a book location for many years. The course came within a mile of Bushy Mountain Prison, where James Earl Ray was still incarcerated. See episode 19 for more details. The name Rat Jaw was based on what that section looked like on a map. The course remained the same from 1989 through 1994. Cantrell must have scared runners away. That year, only 14 runners started. Fred Pylon started his fourth Barkley and led the pack, finishing the first loop in 7 hours and 45 minutes. But only Pylon and two others started the second loop, and none of them made it to the halfway point. Nora Hen Fisher became the first ever woman to finish one loop. For 1990, the popularity of Barkley increased with 29 starters with many repeat victims. The race fee had increased to $1.55. For the first time, the field included some international competition, including the famed racewalker Yuli Kamm from Germany. Barkley attracted some new elite runners. David Horton started consistently running in 1977 and in 78 he moved to Virginia to teach at Liberty University. Soon thereafter he took up ultra running and ran in his first ultra, the JFK 50 in Virginia and placed 24th. I was reading in Running Times about this race called the JFK 50 miler and they showed people up on the Appalachian Trail running and I thought, huh, I think I'd like to do that. So when I went to do the race in 1979, I'd never met uh, anyone who had ever run an ultra or talked to anyone who had done an ultra. And I went to that and finished 24th out of 400 runners and 743, not that I remember. And I thought, uh, hey, I can do this. He then knew that he found something that he could do relatively well in. The following June, he ran his first 100 miler, 1980 Old Dominion, where he finished in 21 hours, 45 minutes. He would go on to win that race in later years three times. In 1985, he won the prestigious JFK 50 in six hours, 16 minutes. In 1986, at the age of 36, he ran a blistering 100 mile time of 14 hours, 26 minutes at Flushing Meadows coming in third. 
By 1990, Horton's slowest time in a 100-mile race up to that year was 22 hours and 5 minutes. Surely, if anyone could be the first to conquer the Barkley 100-mile long run, Horton could do it, right? Eric Clifton also ran again, and elite runner David Drock came along too. The fastest runners headed out at the start, leading the pack, but because of foggy conditions, these speedy virgins soon went off course and had a very hard time finding the first book. Furta, with his Barkley experience, had no problem and was surprised to see at the first book that no pages had yet been torn out. Frozen Ed was in first place and continued to lead through the first two loops, finishing the first loop in a record 7 hours 16 minutes for the newer course. But he quit after loop two, despite Cantrell's prodding for him to continue. Clifton went slower on the first loop, guiding his wife Shelby. When she quit after one loop, Clifton sped ahead and eventually caught up to Horton, Drop, and another runner on the second loop. They all finished loop two. Yuli Kam finished the second loop in a courageous 23 hours 44 minutes. With swollen knees, he wisely bowed out at that point. Horton, Clifton, and Drock were the only ones to start loop 3 of 6 and finished the loop 3 together in 26 hours 22 minutes. They completed loop 3 in time to continue on for the fourth loop. Clifton went out to do 100 meters of loop 4 to claim the longest Barkley ever attempted. Horton was just waiting for his chance. With only seconds remaining to leave on loop 4, he went out and traveled 150 meters to claim the record. Horton later said that his three-loop accomplishment at Barkley may have been his best ultra-running performance of his career. Most of the runners thought Cantrell's six-loop 100 was a joke and couldn't be done. Horton said it was the toughest course in the world. The 55-mile fun run version of Barkley would start to be figured out with 10 finishers in 1991, 2 in 1992, 11 in 1993, and 1 in 1994. Many of the earliest finishers were smart people with PhDs. There was a Swiss runner who broke his ankle during a loop and instead of taking the quitter's road back, had hopped on one leg for the rest of the loop. In 1995, the loops were increased to 20 miles, making a three-lap fun run 60-miler. Zipline and Big Hell were added to the course. The 100 miles, now the official Barkley finish, required five loops with a 60-hour cutoff. That year, Tom Possert was the first to complete the 60-mile fun run and said before he left for home that he didn't think anyone would ever finish the 100. He should have stayed longer because that year, Mark Williams of the UK, a two-time finisher of Spartathlon, became the first to finish the full 100-mile version of the Barkley Marathons in 59 hours, 28 minutes, and 48 seconds. He would go on to finish Spartathlon 13 times, but finish Barkley only once, along with a fun run in 1996. When Williams finished, Horton came up to him and said, quote, now you have ruined it for everybody. I used to come here and try to go as far as I could and then go home. I wouldn't finish and thought it was impossible. But now that is gone. It is possible. Barkley was now well established and ready to crush the dreams of hundreds of runners in the years to come. If you enjoy these podcast episodes and want to help contribute, please visit ultrarunninghistory.com and please use the donation button. With that, this is Davy Crockett and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. Mm-hmm.